I thought this was not a single command. It was oh, a yeah. misunderstanding on my part. Yeah, no, like, no worries, no worries. That's, that's an easy thing to confuse. Well, here, I'm going to take this opportunity to go and start. I'll start updating the meeting minutes here. So, do, 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 do. 24th. Oops. All right, so we've been doing the MNIST handwritten digit. Digit demo um, uh, confusion about here doc for um, child three four sum uh, cleared up. Uh, also, this uh, config loader error, uh, right? You told me to uh, load the one of the files from the docs, right? Uh, yeah, so that was the other, I think that's the only other, like, sort of open thing on this. It's basically, yeah, just grab that file path, right? So you need to, you, you want to, I don't know if that's exactly the right, uh, that's exactly the okay, right so path. So it gives, uh, but... uh, I, I, it's the right path, but it gives me an error, like, uh, where did that file go? Oh, yeah, and then we'll want to get rid of that code block console there. Okay, so here it wants a bytes IO type resource, right? Oh yeah. Oh, so do uh, sorry dot read bytes then. Um, here uh, it'll basically be dot read bytes. Here I updated the comments. If you refresh that. Okay. Uh, Yay! So there we go. Okay. So that all looks good. Great. Okay. Okay, I think I'll uh, push the these Here. few small changes uh, right now in five or ten minutes. Sweet. Okay, and so then reload this page real quick. Um, all right, and then you should see yeah dot read bytes. All right, so okay. yeah, so basically that will give you the bytes from that file, and then you should be good to pass that into load B. So just get rid of the wait dump B replace it with this whole mess here. Um, and then as long as that path is correct, I think it's correct. Um, because oh, parent yeah, of this right. should be test. So test dot dot would be PNG. PNG dot dot would be config loader. Config loader dot dot would be the root of DFML. And then examples, MNIST, MNIST, or image one dot read bytes. So that should give you the right image there. And basically if it works, it gave you the right image if it didn't. Or well, what you should do here is you should, you should print out that block and then like paste that block into the file here and then do an assert equals on you know some global standard array there or some global array there that that contains the the output of whatever the bytes were and that way we just make sure that, that it's always right okay. okay thank you so much yeah no problem thank you that, this is looking great i think we're almost done right here like this should be it and then we'll have this demo done yeah, That's I'll push exciting. the changes in five to ten minutes, and then it's, it'll be ready to merge. Should, everything yeah, it should well. be good. Sweet. All right. Hey, thanks, Sakshom. So let's see what else we have on the docket here. Um, let me go back and so uh, Agen, I can't remember what we were sort of talking back and forth. I think I lost track of something that we were talking about. I also haven't gotten a chance to read everybody's private messages to me yet because I've been swamped with things. But I will be doing that first thing after this meeting. So uh, we wanted to have operations without input cell start. Right? Oh, yeah. You wanted to know when you should cancel them? Yeah, when to start. Yeah. Okay. Or should we cancel them or like what are we going to do with it? Yeah. So, uh, also, we I can, uh, it's kind of hard to hear you. So, um, I don't know. Yeah, if there's some kind of mic fixing we can do there. But, okay. So, uh, yes, that's much better. Um, so, 
wouldn't to cancel those. So I think that 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 becomes more of an issue actually with those async iterator operations, um, like mm -hmm. where they may just live forever. But these ones, like you know, so basically we should have if you control C the thing, it's going to stop, right? And it will run all those cleanup operations, and it may not run the output operations, but we should probably have. This isn't this. I I couldn't quite figure out what what to respond to this because it's sort of like a larger thing and it's kind of a separate thing, um, yeah. because we could ha run into this situation even without these operations, without inputs, right? You could have some operation that like just gets hung, right? And uh, and so what? This, it's sort of like a separate issue we maybe need to make here. So let's so let's make a record of this. So this is uh, what, uh, so when slash how do we, okay, I am sharing, great. Um, facilitate uh, canceling of running operations slash data flows. Because um, that's really what we're what we're what we're thinking about here in sort of a grand scope, right? So what happens if we have um, if we have this data flow that's running and there's some operations that haven't completed yet, so therefore the data flow hasn't completed, um, and then what do, what do we do with it if all of a sudden we want to stop it like a graceful stop? Um, and so we need to basically, I think this is something that that maybe we need to add to the config of the orchestrator or something. Um, or maybe it needs to end up in the config of the uh, orchestrator context. Um, so because the orchestrator context, I believe, takes a data flow in its config. Um, let's just verify that. Um, let's see. Uh, it does. Let's see. Uh, DF memory. Yeah, okay. So memory orchestrator context config takes a data flow. Oh, and also takes reuse. That's right. Um, so, okay, let's see. Yeah, so we probably want to add a parameter to that config there. Um, and then, let's see. So we probably want this to be configure. Uh, oh, okay. Mm. So, let's see, the data flow itself, and this is kind of, so what I'm thinking about right now is like, it's kind of like the same thing we ran into with the validation stuff. It's like, okay, what scope does this stuff act at, right? Because we don't want to put it in yeah. the wrong scope, and then we end up with something that, that doesn't, like, you know, that's that doesn't transfer around well as we change things. So, the data flow is responsible for defining, like, what happens um, between the operations. The orchestrator is responsible for... Um, like, are you planning to put some sort of counter or something? Like, what are we planning here? For what? Like, uh, for the operations, like, uh, what are we actually planning? Like, what are we aiming at? For what, in what context do you mean? Like, uh, this context, like, uh, we are... We want to have some stop method, right? So, like, what's our criteria for stopping? Yeah, what's our criteria for stopping? Yeah, so it. I mean, you could basically have like so. There's there's a few things, right? Well, uh, uh, there's a timeout thing, right? And at some point, that will need to be involved, right? And that might be something that gets specified on like the. Um, there might. Like there, if it's a timeout, I think it better if it goes in the operations config or something. Yeah, like in the in the operation definition itself within the yeah. data flow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, because then you might this is something you would likely define when you write the operation. You would say this is the timeout for this thing. Um, yeah. and then there's other things like so then then you would have other things I think like uh, um I think this might need to go at the so let's just make some notes here. Um, so timeout, so timeout could should be configured in uh, operation 
So at op um, definition or dot op. Like, since we are planning to have a nodes for operations, uh, they would also need this, right? Uh, we're planning to have what? Like uh, nodes as like we are in the distributor orchestrator thing. We'll have nodes serving operations, right? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't the nodes also require time? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm missing. It's it sounds like you're saying node serving, or what are you saying? Like uh, in the distributor orchestrator thing, like uh, we'll have a node which is servicing some arbitrary set of operations. Yeah. That's what we plan with. So yeah. wouldn't the nodes also need to stop after some time like, if they don't get any inputs? Or oh, oh. Um, that will be a separate thing. That would be taken care of because we're looking at so. In this context, we're looking at like what is the data flow running. The nodes themselves will be like managed by the orchestrator in that in that situation. Um, in this in this situation, we're just talking about like for this data flow when these operations are running. Like when should I consider, you know, like when is is there, yeah, like, um, you know, if this if this operation stops running or like if this operation stops producing outputs. And if it's one of those that if it's something that just stays there and produces outputs like and keeps doing that, like the if we're looking at the chat example, like, okay, it's a chat bot. If I with that thing, it's there's probably no timeout on that one, right? And but you know, say there was, right? Then if after some time we don't see any new chat messages, then we stop the whole data or then we we kill the operation, right? Um and we probably need several different modes. We need like the well, let's see. We need this is sort of this is there's going to be a lot of exploration that happens here, right? Because it's going to be like what yeah. what makes sense. Um, yeah. And so there needs well, one thing is we need to have like a timeout on an operation, right? And that's sort of a separate thing. So that's sort of like a separate thing from this in itself, right? Because this is for an operation. So for operations, operations. Uh, we need a timeout because, um, like, this could be something where um, this could be something where, for example, we have an HTTP request that gets made, uh, but it doesn't complete complete within within time out period. Uh, then we need to have um, we need to have something which tells us uh, do we rerun the operation um, like do we do we keep trying if it doesn't happen within the timeout or do we raise some sort of like do we raise an exception um, or if it doesn't happen within a few times do we raise an exception like we're going to need extra properties on this as well um, so this is maybe something that we want to look at or maybe make an issue for and uh, and look at sort of later because uh, this is going to come in, in into play here um, but it's a bit different than I think what we're talking about with the uh, well with what you're going to hit with the async iterable operation operations uh, because so so the reason why this is like something that I obviously this is it's sort of a longer conversation and this is why I can type back to you quite um, so yeah so because what what we have here is we have this situation where we have properties like a timeout on an operation where we might want to we want to be able to specify per operation like what do we do if x happens like how does the data flow treat that for this operation and then we have other things like um, okay well I have control like I can I'm running the data flow via the command line and I hit control C right so okay and, and let me just write this down so if running data flow from command line and we hit control C um, we're gonna have currently uh, we run all the cleanup operations um, and then we just call it quits um, 
and then, or what does it happen? Yeah, anything that's already returned through, right? If you have multiple contexts running, so any contexts that are in progress, we run the cleanup operations for. But if your context is already done and it's run the output in the cleanup stage, then it's done, right? Um, so all con we run all cleanup operations for all uh, input set contexts, which are haven't entered the uh, or which are still still in the uh, processing stage. Um, so now what we're thinking about here is like, okay, well, what if we, in this case, it's like, okay, we hit the control C and we probably want to go straight to the output stage in this case, right? So in new case, where we have a long running operation, which is feeding inputs to the data flow at any time, say from the chat. Um, we want to want to be able to say uh, if these, uh, so for, let's see, we want to be able to say like if control C is hit, aka data flow is told is stopped, um, then uh, these operations or so, and if this set of operations the set would include be the chat uh the wait for for chat message operation operation uh only consist of in this case so it would only so this in this case right we we have some sort of property on the data flow level um probably within the data flow itself because this is like large part of defining like what this data flow does is we're saying okay if at any time we're told to stop the data flow and this thing is still running just go right to the output stage don't go to the cleanup stage because this thing will run forever so basically we're assuming that these kind of operations will be will be running forever um and let's see uh that actually may be a better thing to put in the this is, yeah, this is like, it's hard to figure out. Uh, that may be actually a better thing to put in the data flow or the, into the operation itself, right? So if we look at these timeout things, so the timeout is at an operation level. This is probably also at an operation level, right? Um, because when we write this getter operation to pull from getter, it's, I mean, it knows that it's just going to keep pulling from Gitter until Gitter goes down, right? <laughs> so, or you lose connection, maybe, yeah. right? Like, it's always just going to sit there. Um, so maybe, maybe, um, okay, let's just put this here. Um, we, let's see. Uh, we want to be able to save control C, then this set of operations um needs to or is okay that they haven't completed uh, don't skip the output stage uh, okay like don't don't go to the cleanup stage before before or without running the output stage. Okay, um, so uh, we'll define this uh, property. So like whatever this property is called, maybe like the long running or like, I don't know, in, uh, like, like, oh, there's something that, that GCC uses. So GCC, does not return. What is this called? Maybe we can borrow this. Um, what is this? Um, we can borrow this syntax here, and that way it makes sense. 
no return. Okay, yeah. Maybe we should just call it no return. On this property, no return within the operation. Uh, okay, so that, I mean, that's, I guess that's what we would do here. And so then within the data flow, we would go through and look at all the operations that we're loading that have this no return property, and then we, we treat it like that. Um, we, we treat it like if you get the kill signal, then still run the output operations if this is one of the running active instances, right? So if we're told to stop uh, at any point, uh, then if the only, the only operations that are running are our uh, operations with no return return set um, then let's see that are running our operations with no return set then don't then then just stop them them and go to the output stage rather than current behavior of skipping to cleanup stage. All right. Okay. I think, does that make sense? Does that sound reasonable? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think so. It seems like this is, yeah, this is kind of, it was, I was having a hard time figuring out what to say about this. Um, so I think that we arrived on something that, that would work here. Um, maybe we want to give it some more thought, right, before go implementing it. But let's, so let's make some issues for this. Um, so, yeah, and I don't know exactly how we're going to describe this in an issue format, but so let's make an issue to, uh, to track, uh, what should we call this? Maybe like, this is like operation properties or something like operation, uh, both of them are separated. Like one is uh -huh. thing and the other one. The other one maybe we can take care of the self start issue and the timeout thing. Yeah, we might make an issue for them. Yeah, they're they're both they're both separate issues. So let's make issues issues. God, wow, okay, issues. Wow, okay. Uh, to track this, um, and I think think these attributes should go in some substructure or should they maybe they should maybe they shouldn't i don't know so the thing is what i'm thinking about right now is the fact that um, um let's see bam examples should i should i should i deploy uh, override yeah give me the override okay here so when we're looking at these operations right so far we've got inputs name output stage and that's sort of like it's pretty manageable um we could start adding other things at this top level here or we could make something that's like extra and then put in stuff there but maybe we'll just we'll just keep them all at the top level for now and we can move them into some substructure later if they get out of hand so let's make issues to track this just call that good okay um okay and then was there anything what how else are things going for you again uh, I want to talk about the distributor kind of thing, but I think it will take some time. So okay, yeah, let's pray. Let's pray. Hold off on that then, um, and then we can. We also, can uh, there's one thing I wanted to point out. Yeah. Like yesterday, when the test ran, uh, the TensorFlow estimated thing actually failed because of that case. I thought we fixed that. Like, oh, the. Ran into it. Yeah, the the error threshold on that, on the TensorFlow thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that too. Um, yeah, I think we still need to like lower. The second time it passed. Yeah, I mean, okay, so the the usually we just all we really need to do on that is just rerun the. Um, that's very annoying. I know. Um, we need to just rerun the. Uh, rerun the CI if you see that happen. I mean, I, I always check and I notice that if it says model TensorFlow, it's usually what it is. Um, 
but yeah, the only reason why I I hesitate to take out that test or lower it further was because that one time when we when we did do that transition from TensorFlow one to TensorFlow two, we noticed that that things were messed up because of that test. Um, so yeah, well annoying. It's gonna stay around um, the yeah, randomness okay. of it. But let's see. So I think this is good to go then. Um, yeah, let's see. Anything else on this pull request specifically, or no, 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 no. okay, cool. Yeah, this one was sort of separate, but and then yeah. uh, did you say you mostly just want to talk about distributed stuff? So yeah, that's okay. Yeah, let's hold off on that and, and hit some other people's things then. So cool. Um, so who else is on that that wanted to talk about stuff? I assume everyone, but who wants to go next? Hello, John. Are you hey. here? Hey, yes, how's it going? Yeah. Uh, so oh, you I cut. was looking for the PI that, that I just, uh, before a few days I made about Thirst. Oh, yes. Uh, the four, fifth one. Four yeah, days. I was just going to look at this again. I saw your recent comment here. Um, and you said, I guess yeah. I don't quite understand what was going on then. Um, so. Uh, I want to ask it why we need to now store it into the test file and get you know file what we were storing in the download file till now oh you mean like why would we change these paths yeah. to be okay yeah, so yeah. yeah so what I was thinking here is what we'll do is we'll change this format here to be from test slash cargo audit hyphen download to test download and then cargo audit and that way we'd put all of these things under test slash download and we could just list test slash download in this git ignore file and that will also let us do um so there was this thing i did recently here so we added so you can use the there's a cache functionality within um the github actions and so what we can do is we can take uh we can take this okay well this is not a very helpful example here but we can we can specify a path and so we can specify slash examples slash should i slash test slash download and then it will just grab everything under there and that way uh, since we have this cache download function it will pull from the cache and it should speed up our ci test by a lot um that's why we wanted to do that. So that's it's sort of something that that we could do. I think did I say in a separate PR? Yeah. So this is just sort of like for next time. I wanted you to know, uh, like once we finish this PR, then we can start doing that in in the next ones. And I was asking that I should need uh, should I do all before the previous work that I have made to also test download. Yeah, let's put them all in there. Yeah. So after we put, so basically we'll we'll merge this one here. So let me let me make some notes here. So for uh, uh, PR two forty one or wait two forty one? No, that can't be right. No, yeah, this is for issue two forty one four sixty eight. Uh, so PR four sixty eight, um, which is should I uh, rest or cargo? Audit support. Uh, we let's see. Or well, this isn't really for that PR. So, so for for examples. So should I download caching uh, uh, in future PR? We want to move all of the download or the cached downloads loads into the examples slash should I slash test slash downloads folder uh, that way we can speed up speed up the CI by having them cached um, and then for PR, this, so, okay, so are we clear on that then? That's just a future PR. So we'll get this one merged, um, and then we'll do that. So that should be sort of your next course of action there. Um, and then on this one, you were saying, so what were you saying on this one? Did you try... Um, uh, uh, for the cargo audit file that you commented... I have downloaded the Rust file till now, and I haven't downloaded the cargo the cargo file. I just came to know that from the PR. 
that you have commented on it. Okay. So so you still need to you still need to make those yeah, I need okay to, yeah, I okay need cool to. and then yeah i think you saw what i said here basically i think this yeah. probably just got copy pasted <laughs> funny yeah. yeah yeah it looked good when i downloaded it and i extracted this looks like the correct file path so like i think it will work but yeah then yeah. just obviously so this stuff this stuff is your it says cargo cargo audit audit but you're downloading rest so you'll just need to add the other one to add to download uh to car download cargo auto itself um sure. but yeah this looks good um sweet nice job yeah. also i have created a curated list for the uh, languages that uh, i am aiming to oh end. great 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 uh, you mentioned that sql will not be a good option for adding oh yeah so well i think the thing is about sql is is you know you're not really going to run into sql like in a in a flat file very much right yeah. unless it's some sort of dump of a database and those are usually automatic dumps um and so i don't think you're it's it's going to have it's it's really just not going to get used that much right so we want to target things that that are are going to get used a lot right yeah um, so I think things like you know main main more mainstream languages like oh I think PHP might be a good one too. Um, there should be I think there's this thing that yeah. framework that people use called uh, Composer and it. stuff. Okay. There should be some some tools around that. But yeah, um, was there anything else on that front? No, no, thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right, let's see, almost. Yeah done just need to add I just need to uh, uh, add uh, cargo audit download and modify rest download all right so let's see what else do we have here um, let me go back to our queue here um, so okay uh let's see and um i what was your uh skip on github what i'm i'm sorry i don't know how to say your name this is your first first call with us right yeah yeah this is my first call how, how do you pronounce your name uh sudhanshu sudhanshu yes all right That's great me. hey nice to meet you sudhanshu thank you for for jumping on the call with us so uh, let's see. Let's check this out here. Yeah. Okay. So this was, and I'm sure we've all run into this. Um, basically, these files, right? These generated files. I was thought it was important to check them into the Git repo at first, and now I'm realizing it's just resulting in us having to run the doc script um, and and then commit the changes where in fact the doc script runs the generator for these files so it's kind of pointless um, so, so we just uh, uh, we don't really need them um, if we change the uh, if we change the doc strings they will get regenerated and rebuilt anyways so I think we are all good here to just remove these um, this looks good. Let's just capitalize this. Uh, let's see, because uh, that just to say, stay consistent here. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Um, and then you've been working on um, various other things. Um, did you have anything that that is like your next next steps or anything that you? Uh, uh, so uh, I wanted to ask about the GSOC project. Like, I yeah. Have, uh, send a proposal from the dashboard. So. Oh yes, you... that's right. So I've been I've been having some issues me and the other me and the other mentors we've been having some issues with the dashboard I'm gonna to try to get that cleared up that is the next thing on my okay. on my docket to do is figure out what's what's going on with all that um, so because there's 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 two things going on basically there's a Python GSOC dashboard and then there's the Google dashboard and, and we're having some issues getting everybody on both dashboards because you have to be on both dashboards this year yeah. um, so it's a slight change from last year but we're going to we're going to get that that all all figured out and, and I just got an email from Google that the review period has been extended by another week um, so your submission period is still through the 31st for students but we will be reviewing things through another week after that I believe so let's check out the timeline here Fine. let's see um, let's see application review period 
I don't know if they've changed this yet, but I got an email. I will I will make sure they will make sure you guys know as well if you're all logged in and signed up and stuff. But yeah, um, let's see. Um, uh, mentors for GSOC, GSOC. Uh, I know you guys. So you guys have been submitting your proposals and your draft proposals, and if you have feedback that you want, I believe you can submit a new. Pro so you you can't leave it at draft stage. Like you have to submit a final rep proposal. If you want feedback on your proposal, you should say like you can say to me you can say to uh gash there's other gash um and there's sudarsana and rahul and arvind is also going to be a mentor and terry's like a, a half a mentor um she's sometimes here sometimes not but she's got a lot of things to do um so but but mainly like if you if you say it to me i will broadcast it to the other mentors um but if you say it to them they will broadcast to us but um so it doesn't matter where you say it if you say please review my proposal to one of us we'll make sure it gets reviewed um and if you've submitted it through the site um as soon as i figure it out today it's it's uh we'll 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 all be on the same page and we'll look at the draft ones so if you have any specific things, you can message me, and I'm I'm making sure all the other mentors are getting the same message, so that we can all provide feedback. Um, and then I'm so what I'm doing is I'm combining the I'm if a student sends me a proposal and says, "Can I have feedback?" I'm broadcasting it to the other mentors. We are all giving our feedback, and then I'm sending you back the feedback that everybody did. Um, and that way, it's not like okay, we're we're all sending each other different things and no one's on the same page it's like okay if if somebody says something all the mentors do feedback and then i get back to you um which means that it may take a, a little bit longer um but uh we will get you'll get everybody's feedback um and so just make sure like that you do submit the final like because you have to submit a final proposal because we can't accept proposals that are still in draft status but obviously you yeah. can't you want to wait to submit the final proposal because you can't change it once you've submitted it um so you want to leave it as a draft up until whenever you're comfor latest comfortable leaving it and then submit it right um and so i'm going to try to i'm going to try to loop back on everybody within the next couple of days and make sure that we've reviewed everyone's drafts that that has submitted them up until this point and we will keep doing that um if you if you want review on your draft um okay. so yeah uh basically oh. that will be very soon here it's my next action item after i finished i fin i think i'm almost caught up on everybody's pull requests here um so yeah um so gsoc let me say uh some have will be reviewing or starting review review of everyone's drafts uh, today. Um, okay, and we'll mentors will keep you posted. Are updated um, on reviews. All right. So, yeah, no worries there. I'll let you guys know. So I will. Let me just just so that I'm I'm held extra accountable here. John will let everyone know when we've got all the mentors mentors uh, correctly configured in all of the portals okay so all right um let me make that an action item for myself so control shift m, control shift m. okay assigned to me all right great so um okay anything else gsoc related since we're on that Any random GSOC questions or anything? I think you guys have all so far. You've got the, you've got the hang of things. I mean, this is this is the way it works 
we work on stuff, we submit proposals, and then we continue to work on stuff. So, yeah. Um, okay. All right. Is that? Um, did you have anything else you wanted to? You you just review the draft, or is there anything else you wanted to uh, to talk about? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I also wanted to talk about the played ML uh, wrapping. Oh yeah. Cool. So cool. Uh, like I have uh, like ideas for like wrapping played ML uh, in the GSOC period. Uh -huh. But uh, right now I'm feeling that uh, the wrapping the auto escalon will be like a great fit. Yeah. So should I add uh, wrapping played ML as a stretch goal? Like, stretch goal in yes. my proposal i think that's that's very appropriate yeah um the other thing about wrapping wrapping auto sk learn is that we have a lot of the stuff for scikit and it looks like they copy a lot of the um psychic so if you've been looking in model scikit and we may we yeah, may yeah. find this when we look at your draft and stuff but if you've been looking in there we do a lot of like automating the wrapping of the scikit models um and so it looks like they have consistency on their doc strings and class definitions and stuff that we can reuse the auto wrapping um we may be able to reuse the auto wrapping so uh we'll see i mean we'll see how that goes right um but yeah um, and then basically, so basically my point with that is, of course, if it turns out that the auto wrapping is pretty consistent there, um, then it's pretty much going to be a case of like copy paste scikit and then move on to platyml. Um, obviously it never works out quite that easily, but, um, you know, if there's, there's, if that is the case that it's mostly compatible, then that's, that's probably going to be most of it. So yes, I think that's a great, great idea to put that as a stretch goal there. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, and then so who else do we have here? Um, let's see. Who else wants who wants to go next? Hey, hi, John. Uh, Himanshu. Hey, Himanshu. How's it going? So uh, yeah, I saw uh, this I, looks pretty much. What that does? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. I think. Oh, let's see. Oh no! Did I not? Oh damn! I forgot to submit this. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the one question I had here was basically why did why did you capitalize the sentence ID in words? Uh, yeah, because the thing is, uh, like the, our basic format is we'll have one features and there will be one predict, right? Uh, but in this case, we can have features, but only two features are required always. One is sentence ID, and the other one is words. Mm -hmm. So in the if we don't give the user like specifically that we want sentence ID and words, then anybody can enter anything basically right? yeah. if you just put model features then any features they can put right yeah so i was thinking uh maybe just sentence id in the words okay be better so, and that way yeah because because yeah. or else they would just they would probably yeah, get they can, confused they can yeah. Put any columns there. yeah yeah we don't we don't want to to we want to make it as point and shoot as possible that's great um yeah. but i guess just why are they capitalized then uh, yeah was I, there I just, just to make it very okay. clear, I, I just thought that. Okay, so, let's uh, just make them. To change to yeah, let's just make them lowercase, just in case, because these are quite right now. They're the only things that are that end up being capitalized. Um, okay, okay. And then the other thing would be that 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 sentence ID is uh, okay. So this is a problem with the unified config stuff, um, right? And you've noticed, luckily, that you have to do underscores. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, that's a that's a pain. I'm, it's on my list. It's on my list, but it's a, it's a long project. Um, so, um, the thing is that that yeah, any, any things with underscores, um, well, they're good for like these very extended things that that people may not use that often. Um, I think since the sentence ID and the words are probably they're going to be used every time with this, right? And it might be better to go with like SID or something, and then in the in the help text okay. explain that it's the sentence ID. Um, because okay, okay. Uh, just just because that way you know if you're typing things sentence underscore ID is, is not as convenient to type as as SID so yeah so unique ID yeah and so then if you just said it would just show up as SID here and then words here and I think that would sort of uh, that would make it it, it just as a uh, little a little bit more um, okay. user friendly maybe sure. so yeah other than that this looks perfect you've done an awesome job on this this is like this is wow! Okay, Great job, yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is uh, there's a lot going on here. 
Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, this is cool stuff. Um, and just for my own education, I think everybody else on this call. Um, so you have, I, I'm not super familiar with all of these, this kind of NLP models that's going on here. Um, but so you declare, you provide it with these training examples and then you, you have some test examples. And, and in this, what you did was, uh, let's see if I can pull down to the, um, where are the examples here? Uh, where did they go? Where did they go? Okay. Yeah, so where's the data? Okay, so this is the test data, right? So, oh, where's the train data? Um, okay, so in, in, the, in the training data, what you've got for us is we say the sentence ID, we say the words, and we say the tag. And then what comes through here is so you're you're basically tagging every word and you're saying these words belong to these sentences right uh, yes yeah, so yes yeah, so this is because uh, we'll have to work on source because we can directly read the text but mm -hmm. that will um, we can't do for now so for that uh, what we need to do, this is the specific format when it comes to name entity recognition yeah so what i have here is i have a sentence dfl models are cool okay uh -huh. and this is a single sentence sentence number one so that's why the sentence id is one 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 in all uh -huh. of them yeah then when it comes to dffml this is a miscellaneous word but uh, b means the beginning of a miscellaneous word yeah models is inside of a miscellaneous word R is uh, like O is nothing. It's uh -huh. not any entity. Yeah. And then, so similarly, I have just put in something. Okay. So okay. Like the second sentence, then the FFL models can do classification. So mm -hmm. this is sentence two, and yeah. all the words are tagged with the. Okay. NER tag. With their approach. Okay. So the any and and NER is it's that's the specific type of, uh, I guess like. We're like, this is something that, uh, and obviously I'm not familiar with the NER stuff. So this is like something where, um, if you want to, if you, if you, if you wanted to figure out what all those tags are, you would go to this, you know, you would go to hugging face transformers and, and they have all the tags for you and, and they would tell you sort of more in depth what, what, how we should be tagging things in sentences and stuff. Right. Or. I'm just thinking like I've got the I've got I I think it you've shown the idea here behind like what do you what do you do um, you know here's here's how you here you provide the sample training data and then the test data and my assumption would be right now with the training data and the test data you've got the same examples in the training are the same ones in the test right so if you provided different different sentences in the test, it would sort of it would do its best, right? It would do based on the trained model. It would do its best to classify which ones are I misc or B B misc or O, right? Um, and is there any like is there where where would people find like s sort of uh, all the all the tags that they could possibly use, um, or maybe like something uh, something. Like, are there is you does it no. provide? Hey, sorry, I think you might have cut out there for a second. So, so is there? Hey, can you hear me? Himachu. Hey, uh, hi, John. I think there is some net problem, network problem. Yeah, I think yeah. So I was just saying, it looks like so. You do you have pre-trained in here as well, right? Or Oh well. All right. Well, I think he's having network issues, but I think I think he does. I am just wanted to make sure. Um, but yeah. All right. Hey, Hey, Machu. Hello. Hey. Yeah. Sorry, this is a lot of problem these days. Yeah. Okay. I was just thinking. I was just trying to ask whether maybe you had some pre-trained models in here because I thought I'd seen that. And sure enough, here it is. So you do have the the pre-trained models as well. And and it looks like. Oh, you're cutting out. You're cutting out really bad. 
you're you're you've you've been cutting out really bad, so I can't really hear anything you're saying. Um, but I think oh, sorry for this network issue. No worries. <clears throat> I think you're back now, actually. So, did you want to say yeah. what you were saying? Uh, yeah, so I was saying these uh, these models are already built in in the transformers. Yeah, I just have to uh, like, like there's a dictionary and they have built everything. So I just have to pull from there. Okay, and just put it there. Oh, great, great. So basically, if people want to know, I guess what I'm getting at is 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 it clear when they look at so we say it's implemented using hugging face transformer tensor flow based models? Do we want to? And we've got some little examples here. Do we want to maybe link to where? we can show them, okay, like here's some pre-trained ones, right? Give them a little more information and say something like, um, you know, these are yeah, implemented using hugging face transformers. And here's a link where you can find all the things that, that hugging face transformers can do. And here's, you know, if, if for example, maybe provide another little example that you wouldn't need a test for, um, but just say something about, okay, and here's a pre-trained model or something, right? And here's an example of how to, how to pick from their list sure, of things. Sure. All right, cool. So I'll just make a little note on that. And yeah, I think we're good to go on this. Yeah. Um, so let's also link to where uh, users can find more info on... Uh, existing models and uh, other usage info from uh, main hugging, hugging face. That's hilarious. Face uh, transformers. Transformers. Docs. Wow, I can't spell today. All right, great. And then I think that is good to go. All right. Thank you. Well, yeah. Is there anything you need sort of on deck uh, next stuff? Uh, yeah. yeah. What about our Wapple Webber thing? Because that is stuck. From oh, the yeah. And maybe we, can, yeah, we should finish that. Yeah. So. Um, I know you're quite busy, but uh, whenever you get time. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a, it's a con. So what I'm going to try to do with that is basically just get Conda in the main environment. So because we're obviously going to run into this again. Um, so. Uh, that's that's my plan there. So uh, just one more example. Um, let's see. Or let's see. Just one more example of pre-trained and and then references to main docs. Um, okay. And then so Wopal Wopal Rabbit Wopal Rabbit. Um, John needs to. Figure out Conda in CI. Okay, right, yeah, I'll just I'll put this here again, and I know I've said I will get to this before, but I I will try to get to this. I've just been I've been I've been swamped. I have a I have a lot of things going on, but yes, I will I will I will try to see this see this one through here. So all right, because that would be then we could get that close and done. Um, that one's ready to go. So yeah, all right, great. Um. Let's see. Um, so yeah, anybody else? Who else do we have? Hashim, I think. Yeah, hello. Hey, how's it going? Great. How about you? Good. I can't remember where where you were up to when we last yeah. left off here. Uh, we wanted to doc test our uh, abstract based classes. Oh yes, that's right. Um, yeah. So I looked into it and. Uh, there are a couple of ways you could uh, force your abstract based class to instantiate if you, you know, directly wanted to run tests on it. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't really make that much sense because our abstract based classes won't be doing much on their own. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I tried, you know, uh, getting their subclasses, but uh, there are a lot of dependencies, you know, for yeah. example. If you're taking their uh, a context class, uh, you would have to take the original class as well. Uh -huh. So there are a lot of dependencies you will have to figure out to get the abstract based class. Documented. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm I not think sure about that. I yeah. think what maybe I've been thinking about this a little bit, and, and I think that so in some of the tests we have like fake model and things like that. Um, and then we'll basically just have them return dummy stuff. Um, and so what we could, what we could do is, 
Uh, let me see if I can show here. So let me just make a note here. So we're talking about um, uh, doc testable examples, uh, uh, abstract, abstract base classes. Um, how do we show examples for them? Um, so fake model so in tests. Okay, so let me pull this up here. Can I get you actually to mute if you're not um, talking here? Because I think I'm getting, I think we're getting some feedback, and I know my mic has mm -hmm. feedback, so we're going to end bad. up with we're going to end up with double feedback. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sorry for everybody on the recording. I know that I'm hoping it gets a little better this week. Um, tried to mess with my mic, but anyways, so uh, so we've got this fake model and fake model context here, right? Um, and so what we could do is we could define these guys in, um, so say for example, I'll just sort of show you what I'm thinking here. Um, we take these guys, we move them into, so let's see, if we look at docs, you'll notice that doc test header includes all of the things that we might, we might want. Um, so, ooh, actually, uh oh, how might this go? Hmm, let's see. Uh, yeah, this will work. So basically, doc test header is something that if you look at docs, docs, config, no, conf.py. So we look at docs, conf.py. Um, so the way that this works is uh, Sphinx loads this file and it takes this blob of text that's actually Python but in a string. Um, and it uses that as the the first thing in any of the doc tests. Um, like so, basically, what it'll do is every time there's a doc test, it takes that that those strings out of the doc test, like the the interpreter stuff, um, and it um, and it it prepends this header too. I think I think it makes a new file and then it prepends this header, or maybe it just like grabs that header and and pastes it all in. Um, or like loads it into the interpreter first or something. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but basically the end result is that anything you put in this doc test global setup variable um, as a as a string. So usually it ends up being something like this, uh, like import like from dffml import star is how most of their documentation shows it. Um, like doc test yeah, doc test global setup equals. So this is how most of the Sphinx documentation shows this. So to make this a regular Python file, we basically just said, okay, load, read read the text of this doc test header file um, and call that good. So what we could do is we could put something in docs and now at this point, we'll probably want like a subfolder for all this crap um, because we're gonna do something else just like doc test header and we're gonna do something like, um, you know, uh, uh, fake model.py and we'll just put this fake model stuff in here um, and now what you could do is at the top of you could you could call this like instead of fake model model you could call it example model right and then you could do uh, you could take this stuff and y you could like you could include this file with a literal include Right, so you could go into like, let's see, what is that? Docs, bim, docs, API, um, model, base, right? And you could go here and you could say literal include, include, um, and then this file, right? So slash dot dot slash examples, slash, or not examples, docs slash, uh, fake what it was fake model.py right and so then we'll say something like okay our example for these the following tests is going to be blank and then you know we show them what's the example and then within the doc tests for this thing we're actually going to use this example here um 
and you'll you know you'll call example model context and stuff uh, and so that way they see okay what is this thing doing it's this it's dumb right but it gives us enough it gives us enough of an idea of what's going on for these base classes so that we've got the reference code and then within the abstract base codes um, example docs were actually or like within the abstract base classes doc strings were referencing the example model stuff um, and then so what we do here is we basically just say um, you know at the end of this we'd say doc test global setup plus equals you know a new line new line plus read fake model right and now we just keep doing this for you know fake source and stuff and that way we've got we can we can give a little demo with something that, that doesn't do anything show them that here's what we're actually using and then within the um the 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 doc tests for each method we reference the example model or example source and they the user then sees okay here's what it would look like for any given model or source uh, calling these methods and you know with these dummy methods does that sound uh, does that does that seem seem like a good plan for you from what you've seen as well or it, does that seem like it may not work or this was just sort of what I was thinking about um, to, to solve these issues here yeah uh, that sounds good to me okay yeah I mean of course like I'm not sure what's going to make really the most sense um, uh, maybe we we don't like this may be something where uh, we put this this these this this uh, literal include at the end or something or maybe we put it at the beginning I'm not really sure um, we just need to we know we'll, we'll make it make sense for people so that I mean because at the end of the day like the biggest goal for this is uh, we want people to be able to copy paste random crap from the documentation and have it work for whatever they're doing right um, and so you know the the sooner we can get them to to copy pasting heaven the better um, but yeah, I think I think this hopefully would 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 make it clear. But if not, you know, that's uh, that's it's whatever you, whatever you think would be good then. So yeah, anything else on that yes. or yeah uh, about the example example code? Uh, will it be uh, the already existing code? Does it have to be the already existing code or? You know, we can create our own example. Oh yeah, you can definitely and and like the test code because the test code could be used as a reference for that stuff, but the test code can also get kind of complicated, right? Um, and so definitely dumb it down to the easiest, make it make it very clear what's going on and you probably want to have multiple examples for things right because you know there's different some some things can be called differently um, for example in high level um, there's several ways you can call those functions right you can even pass a file name and it'll turn the file name into a source um, and stuff like that so we'd want to have multiple examples for for all the different call styles for for things um, so that people could say okay like this is the one that i need let me grab that example there or like oh this doesn't really you know one thing may not really fully illustrate what's going on with one example usually people require multiple examples to really understand uh, what's what's going on right yeah cool um, let me write this down here so could it example code to doc slash example model so, uh, um, use uh, fake model and and friends from tests test as a guide. Um, then show what those examples, basic examples, are doing with a literal. Include um, within doc slash API slash base. All right, cool. Anything else on that then, or anything in general from you that you wanted to talk about? 
Uh, no, that's it. Cool. Uh, other than that, I yeah, you, uh, I know you already told us that you'll be reviewing the proposals, but I wanted to know uh, uh, on that if uh, you know the timeline suits uh, all this abstract based classes, the changes, you know. Um. Let's see. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, just because you might you might change your 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 draft or no? Uh, yeah, the draft was uh, submitted before we decided to. Oh, I think you can resubmit drafts. Um, so if you want to change the draft to just mention this, then like then you could re-upload. The, I think you can submit. Can't you submit multiple drafts? I'm not entirely familiar, but. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. We can okay. Do that. Yeah, and you can always send me a draft out of band, um, and I will treat that as you know the latest draft because I'm tracking the draft separately outside of the Google system as well. Um, we've got a separate Google Doc going with the drafts um, so that we, we can we can consolidate comments and stuff, and the mentors can all we can make sure we're getting you all the mentors' feedback, so not just one of ours. All right. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I guess is everybody else good on here? Like, is it just Ogden who wanted to talk some more about things, or did anybody else have anything for the day? Sorry, we ran over a little bit. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask that: uh, Is it okay if I uh, change the test from assert equal to assert true because we are only loading the load b load b function, right? Uh, yeah. Context. But I was thinking, uh, remember, I would, so maybe do like an assert len or something, because, uh, I mean, I, I, so, uh, Agen, could you mute for a second, actually? Okay, great. Um, so, um, so what I was, what I was saying was that you could do a, no, this is the wrong PR, but, uh, you could do a print, basically, so, so just run the test. Uh, so write the test to do uh, load B, and then like don't write any assert, and then write, just say print, and then the bytes, and then just copy paste that buffer into a you know just copy copy whatever it prints out, and it should be like what 748 bytes long or something, and throw it in an array in the top of the file, and then do assert equals on that. And it's going to be a big nasty array, but it will you know be a good test, right? Because if the file data changes, any it'll throw something, right? Because um, just asserting that it's length 748 or asserting that there is something in the array may cause issues if, if for some reason we start loading the wrong things at some point. So you want me to load the file, uh, the byte buffer? Yeah. So basically, let's see. Where did that go? Um, so let's see if I can... Uh, yeah, so do like a, do like a print, um, you know, let's call this, let's just say, so image bytes equals this, so loaded image equals, uh, await, um, loader, ctx.loadb oh yeah ctx.loadb cool ctx.loadb image bytes oops um, and then we just so basically just print loaded image and then now copy uh, the output of okay, okay. the print I, statement wait, won't that be like something like hard coded and yeah that it will well it basically you'll have hard coded the bytes of that image into the test file right which is like uh maybe it's not good or wait oh no you uh, now i'm remembering how i did this last time um uh, oh you can just take the hash of the image um and there's an example of how to do this because i i almost did this one time and then i realized we can just take the hash um so where is it um Grab hashlib. Oh, great! Yeah, there's only a million usages of hashlib. Um, okay, where is it? Um, uh, it's in the tests. Oh yeah, here. 
I think it was the IDX source. Yeah, so, oh, here's what I did. Um, so IDX first, last. So this is like, basically, uh, I looked at the IDX. So you could just, you could like print or, or so JSON dump the, um, Okay, yeah. So look at this test as an example, and this is kind of like this is. I should have commented this more. But basically, what we did here is we went through each of the records, like grab all of the all of the IDX records, right? Yeah. And there's then we check that there should be sixty thousand of them, right? So in this case, like you're only loading one thing, right? Because this is the source, and you're just talking about the one image. So you load it, you assert the length of it is seven forty eight or whatever the length should be, right? And then. Okay. You can basically do JSON dumps dot encode, and then assert that like, and then grab the hash of that, right? Calculate the hash of that, and then print out the hash, save the hash as a static variable in the file, and then just assert that the hash is equal to whatever your you know your statically declared thing is um, after you've done your your printing and copy pasting, right? Um, because that way you don't have to paste that 700 length array in there. You just paste this ugly hash, uh, which is also ugly, but at least shorter, right? So that's oh, yeah. That that's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call on this. I uh, I completely forgot that I'd run into this before, and and uh, in fact, it was you and I that ran into this before. <laughs> All right. So okay, I'll, I'll make the change. Great, great, great. Thank you. All right. Um, so is that all then from everybody? Yeah, that's all from my side. Cool. All right. Well, um, yeah. So, Agen, did you you wanted to to hang around and talk about distributed orchestrator stuff? Yeah. Uh, before that, like last time we discussed about the examples for the data right? So we still haven't finalized the third example, so we want to use the locking feature. Oh yes, the locking feature on the data flow. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had something for this. Um. Uh, like I so. remember you telling that you had to talk to someone at the time before. Yeah. 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 Uh, it was probably Arvind. I probably forgot to talk to him. Um. So, let's see. Okay, so for the first one, we've got the calculator example. That's like, that's that's good enough to get people started. And then we talked about three things. Let's let's go and and we remember what our what our three things were. Um, cause I think we had a good one. So calculator, oh configs, chat, getter, IRC. That's a good one. Oh, oh ping Sean for RPM file maintenance. Ooh, that one would be good. Um, yeah. Okay. Basically. And this one's already up there, actually. Um, let's see if we can pull this around. Let's see. Get stuff. Get diff. Okay. Yeah. Get clean. Oh, don't do get clean. Get reset. All right. Cool. Um, oh yeah, these aren't. All right. Um, so, come on, go away. All right. Uh, where are we? Okay, get check out Bensec. Can you guys see my screen well enough here? It's like, is this big enough? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, my two is in Okay. What? Okay. Here we go. Uh oh, uh, this is probably gonna fuck things up. But okay. Um, oh wait. Oh, for everyone who is still on the call, um, well, this is something I noticed recently. Okay, I screwed this up, but but we'll have to fix it. Just so everybody knows that this is weird happening. Um, so, uh, Hashim, when we switched to doing, because you were building the docs in Docker container, and the Docker container doesn't actually have a user when you're doing it from the development container rather than the production container. Um, so when you do a find and replace on, when, when we do expand user for all of the model directories, let me write this down. Let me make an issue out of this right now. Uh, issues. Okay. So... So, 
model directory uh, not calling resolve uh, for pathlib directories. So we end up uh, when the model directories directories okay whatever were switched over to pathlib.path objects objects um, they end it up treating um, squiggly or tilde as uh, a literal rather than rather than the home home directory uh, because of uh, a lack of a resolve call or maybe expand user but I think ex resolve will sort of do better um, I think it does exactly what we want um, we need to call resolve uh, need to set the directory to property to its resolved self so self dot config equals self dot config dot replace directory equals self dot or config dot directory dot resolve I think I think this is the correct solution um, sorry I just wanted to make a note of this because I saw this and I just saw it again and I'd forgotten um, so labels bug machine learning critical extra short machine learning somewhere maybe somewhere there okay all right um so been sick though all right so these operations um what they do is eh, okay this is like maybe 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 not let's see um okay so this one can probably go in the main repo but basically what would, this was was an operation to take a url and turn it into a bytes object so if you give this a url it gives you a bytes object um and oh it uses aiohttp um, so this actually may have may need like a separate set of operations like a, it may need to go in uh FFML operations net or something uh, because it's third-party dependency uh, but we could have a regular one within the main repo that uh, that uh, just uses URL lib or something and, and declares itself synchronous and, and being a bummer um, no let's not do that that's gonna that's gonna create problems uh, so but uh, the question is like how, how do, can we make this um, how do we make this how do we make this? We maybe could do it even easier than this because it's kind of complicated. Basically, what we could do is we could pass around some sort of object. So the thing is that the reason why this this is a good this this is a good example of sort of locking things is because we have to create this RPM file object itself, um, and this is a thing that operates on this static file buffer in memory. Um, and so we basically we take the URL, we download the RPM um, from the URL, and then we just have this array of bytes in memory um, and then we take this rpm file object and we say hey like your rpm is this array of bytes in memory rather than a file of, on disk um, and now what we want to do is we want to pass that rpm around and we want to extract a bunch of uh, binaries from it and then once we figure out um, yeah we want to extract we want to figure out what are all the file names in it and then every time we have a new file uh, we want to 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 run this uh, this other operation to say is this 
is this binary? So was was the file a binary? And then is the file a uh, position independent executable, which is uh, like a security feature that, that we have. Um, so uh, it it's sort of a good example for locking because this RPM file object can't be used by multiple operations at the same time, so it has to be locked. Um, it's sort of not that great example because it's, uh, there's there's more complex things going on that might confuse people, right? Like, uh, yeah, not every, like yeah. All these yeah, yeah. Like, we like, are rebuilding this optimization, so we don't have that. Yeah, much it's got to be real simple, right? Um, yeah, like, I, I think this overshadows the locking part. Yeah, exactly, right? So that's probably not a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we need to think of something still, and this is maybe just like... Um, Hmm, what could it be? What could it be? Uh, oh, you know what would be good is a. I wonder how this would work. Um, okay, so you pass around an object, and if you don't declare a lock on the object, um, then you increment you increment one of the object's properties uh, by one, and Let's see. What do you do? Uh, we need just like a classic multi-threaded problem example. Um, so something like, okay, we could sleep. Let's see, what could we do? We could sleep for some number of time and then like add the number of time that we slept for and print it or something. Uh, because basically what you would see is that like everybody's sleeping for a different amount of time and uh, I'm not sure. I guess I'll have to think more about this one. But I think I think what we can like the main properties of this one are you're going to have there will be some so there will be some Maybe I'll also look into some task examples of these conditions. What? I'll also look into some classic examples of these conditions. Yeah. Can. Yeah. So, and I mean, usually I think what people do is just something around the idea of like, okay, there's there's a bunch of, uh, let's see, there's like, you know, a bunch of a bunch of timers going off. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's what we could do. We could do something where you have an operation that takes like, it takes this object that needs to be locked. And then it takes uh, time that it sleeps for, and it takes a number. And so after it slept for that time, it sets the object's property because the object is going to be basically a reference since we're in Python, right? So it's all everything's actually a pointer to something, right? So it's going to set that property to whatever that value is, and then and then print it, right? And so if you run this this data flow, you'll see a bunch of series of, of print statements, and they're all going to like sleep for a different time, and then and then print what they set it to. And ooh, let's see. Like, uh, they'll always set it to okay. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's see. Um. Oh, okay. Here's what we do. Yeah. Here's. You can have. You. You you set the property, so you, you the the operation is basically this. It's um, so async or def run me. Um, so it takes object, it takes time or sleep for, and it takes uh, an integer, right? And so what it would do is it say object dot i equals I, right? And then it does await, wait, async, io dot sleep, sleep for. Um, and now it says print object dot i, right? And so what's going to happen is. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, what's yeah. going to happen is you're going to see that since these things don't all run at the same time, they're all going to have. Like different, they, this is this is not going to print anything. Like it's going to print print one value, right? It's going to print whatever the last one 
uh, slept for, right? Whereas if we go and we make this, so then we'd have two, we'd have two sort of examples, right? Like uh, the definition for object uh, is definition, um, and then lock equals true. And if you did, so we'd have one, we'd, we'd basically run this example twice, right? We'd run it yeah, once, okay. yeah, once with the lock equals true and once without lock equals true. And you would see the difference in the prints and that they print the correct thing, right? Um, and I think, I think that would illustrate the locking well enough. Um, so let's see, and let me just, let's just paste this as like, We'll just we'll just save this somewhere. Um, so, just okay. So, uh, base basics of operation for um, for uh, locking example. Okay. And I'll link this. So, and that could be like a dictionary. It doesn't really have to be its own object. Okay, so like an example. Uh, I do once with lock equals or without lock parameter set in definition and once with it set. All right, and that will sort of that I think that'll show it. Um, okay. Um, anything else on that sort of thing? Or? Uh, also, uh, I didn't submit the proposal to the GSOC. Okay. I just sent the link. So okay. I have that sounds like good. This part that yeah, that's fine. Yeah, like I was saying, so if you just, if anybody just sends their proposal to me, I'm going to make sure that all the other mentors see it, and then we'll all give you our, our feedback and send it back to you. So, it's, uh, but you should eventually, obviously, submit it through the main GSO. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, I wanted to finalize this before. Yeah, right. cool. Sounds good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, anything on the distributed orchestrator stuff? Yeah, uh, so like I read, read through the NAS thing and I think I'll go with that for now. So uh, NAS has this thing called NAS stream, which they call stamp. Have you read, read, read about that? Let's see, sorry, no. Um, and you're cutting in and out a little bit, and that's. Uh... <clears throat> so it's NAS stream. Oh, it, oh, it right. shows really That's what? Nat stream. Stream. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, if you just use the regular Nat, it's just a file and forget operation kind of thing, so our data might not get delivered. Oh, yeah. But they have this thing which they call stand, uh, which ensures delivery. So I guess I'll go with that. Yes, that and would probably so, be the one to do. Uh, our node will be like, and it's mostly a single IO base. Uh -huh. Like I feel like both of them, DFO from a land stand shares some concepts. All okay, right, so they have a lot so of async IO stuff. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. And what I want to ask is like, uh, what what are we gonna actually uh, send between the nodes, or uh, is it the orchestrator that uh, like dispatching everything? Yeah. So how, I how think are you, how are you I think that the way to do this is probably um, let's see. Um, okay, okay, let me remember what we talked about here. Um, so we have the nodes, right? Oh, now I remember. Okay. Um, we need to, um, what we'll do is an, a node will run, a node will basically be a running, um, operation implementation network, right? And so you, you, you create this new, we're creating, instead of memory operation implementation network, we now have NATS operation implementation network. And uh, we're going to add some sort of new new CLI interface here to say, like, okay, instantiate one, you know, instantiate operation implementation network, whatever, with this config, and load these operations into it, right? And that will basically be the node CLI command. Um, 
And so this implementation network is basically going to be subscribed. It'll be subscribed to some channel where it's like looking for, um, it, it'll probably be like a, a few, few things, right? Like, first of all, we're going to need to make sure that it's, it's, uh, you may, you may have something where, okay, so, so let me write this stuff down. Um, so we're going to add a node command uh, to the CLI, which um, instantiates an operational implementation network. In this case, NATS operational implementation network. Um, and uh, and anybody like you guys don't have to stay on if you don't want. Um, I know we've talked about all your stuff, so this is just. Uh, this is just this is only for your curiosity if you want to stay up and listen to this. So, um, so and what we're talking about here, just just for anybody who who wants to listen, is is Agen's thinking of of proposing a, a distributed orchestrator project. So basically, we're going to be able to run the the or the data flows in a distributed setting. So you could have them on multiple machines, and different machines would be you know running different operations. Um, and of course, this is this will be nice because you can get a lot of things done, especially CPU intensive things. If you're distributing onto different machines, say you had like you know one data flow where one of the operations is run this you know this model inference, um, use the trained model. Uh, well, that's going to be a CPU intensive operation. You're going to actually need a lot of cores to do that if you're going to do it in parallel, which means you need to do it on a lot of different machines, um, which means you need the distributed orchestrator. Um, so we're going to add this node command to the CLI, which basically this is what you would run on one of the one of the machines um, that's not like the main. So this is like this is a machine that that's tasked with running some set of operations. So we add this node command, which lets you instantiate an operation implementation network and its config. Um, and uh, well, its config is sort of implied, um, but and. Uh, Let's us know which operations to instantiate uh, within that network. Um, so this node so, uh, node uh, one or node n is responsible for running operations. X, Y, Z, um, and so what we now have is like uh, we connect, so connect up to NATS uh, using, and let's see, you say NAT streaming rate. Um, yeah. Okay, whatever. I'll just write NAT streaming. That's streaming. Uh, uh, so the uh, op imp that's operation implementation network connects up to NAT streaming um, and the config may have have properties such uh, such as like I'm not familiar with NAT streaming but it may have some sort of like namespace uh, that you're in, or we could like do this. I don't, like I don't know exactly how we'll do this. We could always take it and say. Uh, it actually uses uh, uh, something similar to the permissions to send that. Uh, like they call it subjects. So okay. That's why it's like, like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Great. So what we could do like is they have channels now, like they how they come in with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because basically all we really need is something to where because I think I think what we need here is is we'll need we'll need a couple levels of things, right? We'll need um, um, or well, actually, wait, we won't really. This isn't how this. Let's see, how should this go? Because um, basically, what we'll have is these. Yeah, yeah. We'll basically it won't instantiate them. It'll say that they're allowed to instantiate these ones. So. Uh, is allowed to run 
operations XYZ because the data flows will actually come in uh, and instantiate them via their connection to this network, right? So, okay, uh, let me just like come down here at level and, and, and try something else. So, we've got we got to look at like what happens from the top, right? So, so first thing that comes in is we have a data flow. Data flow uh, wants to instantiate uh, operations, operation, op, operation implementations. So op imps, right? Um, and so it goes, okay, and where is this issue, issues, um, networks, okay, here, um, so what we need is, goes to the operation implementation networks, um, and that is this issue. So basically, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to make this abstraction around, uh, but just sort of like, just exactly like um, sources, where sources wraps a bunch of different sources. We're going to need to wrap the operation implementation um, or the networks, and we're going to need to have the data flow be able to talk to multiple uh, networks, and that way you'd have sort of like you well. I guess in this case, we maybe don't really need to do this. Um, uh, we probably don't need. Let's hold off on this. Let's let's hold off on this. The the idea behind this one was basically we could have this other thing where you could be hold it. You could be doing things in memory, like you could have the in memory network, or you could have the NATS network. But for now, we should just focus on just the NATS network. So in this case, we go to the NATS operation implementation network um, and uh, orchestrator side um, and so let's see within the orchestra so this should be within orchestrator so not the nodes this is the main like the the yeah, not the nodes. This is, this is the primary dispatcher. Um, so the data flow wants to instantiate operation implementations. We go to the NATS operation implementation network, um, and we say uh, instantiate, instantiate uh, operation. You know every. Uh, instance of each every operation instance we need instance we need for this flow right and so then what we'd have is you know that would be the instantiate method right that we already let me close this um, that's the instantiate method right that we already have so if you say instantiate um, and we're probably going to need we're probably going to need two sides to this NATS operation implementation network. So NATS, um, uh, uh, what would what should we call this? Primary operation implementation network. So and then NATS node, right? Because when this this thing will have, let's see, will it? Uh, basically, when you call the instantiate. So when we call the instantiate method, right? Um, so let's look at the let's look at the data flow code here. So oh. right. So when we look at the memory def instantiate. Right. Oh, instantiate. Full instantiate. Right. So when we when we look at this method here. It takes the operation, and it takes you know maybe the operation implementation. Um, in this case, it, it will not, right? Because it has to be able to load it. Um, and so we're calling this method, and now now you have to think about we're calling this method. Basically, we have we have two situations here, right? So we call this method, um, and this is in the NATS client that's running on on the primary primary node or the like the primary instance right and this is where the orchestrator is running right 
And so when we call this instantiate method, right, when the orchestrator calls instantiates on the on the NATS operation implementation network, it's taking it really needs to publish this to some sort of queue, right? Um, and then all of the nodes are going to be listening to that queue. Um, and when they when they hear um, when they hear that they are you know that we've requested an instantiation of this thing, we'll have to do you know some sort of like the TCP three-way handshake and say like, okay, I'm going to instantiate this thing, and then the orchestrator says, okay, like you can instantiate this thing, and then we say, okay, I've instantiated this thing, right? And then we know that we got one that was instantiated, right? So we know that one of the nodes successfully instantiated an object, right? Or an implementation, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So you've got two sides, basically, on, on the... Think of it as, like, so on the server... We'll, we'll say server and, and client in this case, right? So the server is basically the the master instance, right? And so the master instance says that has the data flow says, okay, I'm sending out, I connect up to NATS and I connect to the some sort of channel that, that all of the nodes are listening on to understand when they need to instantiate uh, objects, right? And so if you, if you, uh, so, so, all right, sorry. Um, okay, so, so main server connects a channel that nodes are listening on to determine when they need to instantiate things, right? And it gets the data flow and it goes and instantiates every instance within every instance of every operation, right? And so to do that, it calls this instantiate method. And server side, this is going to publish to that queue and uh, or publish to that channel. And then the nodes go, hey, I'm allowed, you know, this is in my allow list of, of operations that I'm allowed to instantiate. Let me send back a message. Um, uh, so let's see, let me write this down. Go to instantiate every option. So, so publish need for instance to the channel which uh, nodes listen to. Um, so nodes um, see incoming request to instantiate an operation they uh, within their allow list. Um, uh, publish the need for an request. Uh, see incoming request instantiating arbitration within their allow list. Um, instantiation channel. Okay. Uh, and then they respond uh, that they will, or that, so they instantiate instantiate and respond that it's it's been instantiated all right instantiate the requested operation and then respond that it's been instantiated um, so now, man, and what would really help help here is if we made we start making a flow diagram. Um, but so so now we've completed that initial flow where all of the operations within the data flow are they exist on one of these nodes, right? Their implementation has been loaded into memory and is sitting there, right? The contexts have been entered, right? The main context has been entered on all of them, right? Is that does that make sense? Okay. Um, cool. Um, so, um, okay. So yeah. So we we have the main instance, and then all of the nodes for whatever ones that they're allowed to instantiate, they've now instantiated them uh, for that for some data flow, right? Um, and then 
and and what that involves right is going to be the serialization of the operation structure right and and you could you can choose to serialize and deserialize that however you want right like i don't i would assume that's sort of like you could always throw json over it right um so yeah at a minimum you basically and this is this is so this is exactly why all of this stuff had to be built to be to be serializable and why the input parameter right when we were talking about validation now that's that's when i started to realize uh oh like we made that a function um and that won't work now um so the instance name will be fine it's just that now it's sort of bound to uh it's bound to the data flow right um and so it like you know instance name is a data flow thing and operations don't really have a concept of instance name until they become an operation in a data flow but that's a separate thing um so now we're at the stage where we've we've got the master node and we've got all all the all the other nodes have the operations that they need. So now we basically we wait for we wait for inputs, right? Um, and or what we see we seed all the inputs to the network, right? And what we're gonna do here is we should probably have like the flow. So the um, the flow data flow dot flow uh, tells us where all of the um, it tells us where all of the um, inputs for each operation can come from um, and so what we need to do is basically have something that so we we the orchestrator will decide the permutations, right? And okay, let me let's let's let, let's look at wait, let's look at this diagram, this handy dandy diagram which uh, yeah. which I created <laughs> recently. Um, so let's see. Okay, so um, what we just did here was the operation implementations register with the operation implementation network, right? Um, so now we're looking at okay like there's new inputs right so with those new inputs they come into the input network and let's see is this a case i think we were saying that we might want to do um uh let's see we might want to do mm, let's see let's see let's see um i think it, at a minimum right now we don't need to worry about doing this in Nats, I think what we can do is so basically the input network. So we we have a few options here, right? And I think I think what we'll do first is go with the simplest option, which is going to be we only run the op operation implementation networks it it over Nats basically, right? So anytime we decide that there is new inputs. Um, basically everything has to be on in this case like all all the new inputs are coming uh like things that aren't the outputs of operations they have to come through the orchestrator right wherever the orchestrator is living at this point like for 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 round one here right and then as you advance further in this project you might do something where you implement the input network on top of nats as well right so and, and um Sorry, this is I'm making this more confusing. Um, so basically, what we could what we could do here as a as a first start is we look at the it just uh, sorry. Let me remove this because this is going to make it like we're getting too into the weeds. Um, we're you can you can take. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I feel like we figured this out, and I might be strained from what we said last time. So I want to make sure I'm consistent here. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, the implementation network contracts. So basically, every time you want to run an operation, you would send the parameters out to the queue 
uh, out to the channel that that operation so the implementation network every time it instantiates an operation it will now have something that's listening on a queue for that operation to receive a new parameter set for that operation right so if i publish a parameter set to the queue i i run that i run the operation right using using that parameter set and then i publish the results back to the uh back to the to the well see i publish the results back to the input input set right um i believe is what we do uh, let's see yeah i think this is this is why we decided that um sorry, def run uh yeah Okay, yes, this is what happens here. Run dispatch. Yeah. Okay, so does this guy take a input set context or what does it do? Yeah, OCTX ICTX dot add memory input set. Alright, okay. So that's the deal. So we do need to add this is why we said this last time. So we were talking about last time creating we need an operation implementation network that's based on NATs so that we can listen for new parameter sets and then we're also going to need an input set or sorry not an input set but a uh, an input uh, what is it input yeah a input network um, based on NATs because when we do when we when we run the operation here right um, and we take the the outputs and we convert them into new inputs and then we take that uh, those those outputs that are now new inputs and we add them to the input set context or yeah the the input the input network context um, so you're throwing right. uh, you, so like uh, why would we need a separate network for that convey to send it back to the like the train reading well so so the parameter sets get so when we when we're let's see when we're let's see what was it what was it um oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay we have so the orchestrator sits there and it, it waits for the input set right okay no yeah we have to implement all of these um so the the imp the input network is responsible for feeding all of the inputs in right so you need you need to have a nats channel for new inputs of different types right um and I'm sorry. I'm not doing a good job of explaining this right now. Uh, I feel like I was doing a better job last time. Uh, but last time we didn't get into this much detail. Yeah, we didn't get into this much detail. Yeah. So, okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. How do I explain this? Um, okay. So, every time a new input enters the network. The orchestrator is going to look at it and decide if it needs to if it needs to dispatch if it needs to create a new parameter set for it, right? Um, to dispatch an operation, right? And so we'll have the main node, which is going to be to be deciding whether this is the master node decides. And, dis and and sends out parameter sets, right? So it needs a input network that's going to feed it the results that are published from whenever these operations are run, right? So there are other nodes running the operations, and when they run the operation, they they call when they run the operation, they say input network dot add, right? And so what we need is that input network that we're adding it to to actually be something that publishes all of those inputs as as an input set. To the master node. Yeah, to the to some NATS channel that the master node is listening to, right? Okay, okay. So so let's see, let me write that down. Um so let's see. Uh, okay, so with or goes to the primary NATS operation implementation network. Okay. 
when the instantiation. So when, so let's see. Okay, so the first thing is uh, orchestrator. So let's see. To run the data flow, we add all of the inputs, inputs to the input network, right? And then let's see. And then when our, when things are added to the input network, um, yeah, we look at their context and and then we dispatch the appropriate ones. Um, let's see. The, the operation parameter set pairs. Yeah, okay. Um, to run the data flow, we add all the inputs to the input network, and then um, we generate, generate parameter set, set pairs. Um, um, gen, generate parameter set pairs, and then we say, um, so, and for each parameter set or set pair, uh, or let's see, set operation pair, we call dispatch, right? So we call, um, call, what is that? Yeah, NCTX is the is the operation implementation network. So we call dot dispatch, um, which sends out that operation or sends out that parameter set to the channel where nodes will be waiting to. Um, for each parameter set pair, we call this NATS operation network dispatch, which sends out that parameter set to, the, to a channel uh, associated with that operation, where nodes who have that operation operation instantiated instantiated will be listening or will be waiting. Uh, for parameter sets so that they can, or yeah, we'll be waiting for parameter sets. Once they get one, they run it and add the results back to the NATS, NATS node operation, or let's see, input network. So the nets nets node. So and then we say the nets node input network dot add uh, publishes um, the input set to uh, a channel associated. Okay, and this is where the flow comes in, right? Um, so we look at that flow, and this channel every time. Every time we have, so, uh, let's see. So, uh, do we just publish it and say, we could just say where it came from. Yeah, we can just publish all the inputs as an input set, and then we'll filter through the origins um, when when we're basically listening to that channel. So, the Nats node input, add, input set add publishes the input set to a channel. Um, for that data flow, um, then we do so. Nets, nets. Mm, uh, let's see, like master input network dot added, and like I'm calling them node and master right now, but they may very well end up being the same class. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, so dot added, right, which is what tells us uh, is waiting uh, on that channel uh, to see new inputs from operations come in, uh, or new inputs, uh, yeah, new inputs that were the outputs of 
operation implementation networks come in, right? And then basically the cycle repeats. Uh, I think I think that will that will do it at this point. Yeah. Um, let's see, um, because let's see, what we've got. Let's see, operation parameter subpairs, the redundancy checker. Okay, the dispatch. I think we might need the locking network too. Um, let's see. Yeah, the redundancy checker is going to be. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Well, we just move this stuff in here. So redundancy checker. I don't think we'll need to implement one yet. Um, like just to get this working, right? Because we're basically what we're concerned with here is like how do we just get this a bare minimum example of like what is it like distributed working, right? Um, that's really the project here. So I think if RCTX doesn't get used, I think RCTX just gets used. RCTX um, is only getting used within the orchestrator. Or wait, does it get used? Gather inputs. Yeah, a memory input set or memory network context. Because basically anything that gets used outside of the orchestrator will then need to be implemented outside of the orchestrator. But gather inputs is something that's only going to be called on the orchestrator side of things. So yeah, you may not need to implement the RCTX in, a, in a, anything other. You can probably reuse memory. RCTX, um, because if it's only being called on the orchestrator side of things, then obviously the the nodes don't even need to need to know about the redundancy checks, right? They just need to go execute the operations. Um, so, I think if you implement the input network and the operation implementation network, it will work. Because um, yeah, you basically you publish out things. They listen for what's published. They publish out results. You listen for the results, and you do the standard um, lock network, redundancy network, uh, or redundancy checker on the orchestrator side, um, and then yeah, you publish. Yeah, you just publish out parameter set pairs. Um, so I think this is I think this is what's required here to get it to get it working. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I think that's it. Do you see anything? Let's see. Do you have any immediate questions right here? I know this is kind of a lot, and it's probably late. No, no, no. I'll go through then. I'll ask you later. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Sweet. Um, uh, also, like uh, one other thing, if this is general, like uh, when we are writing the proposal, now, like how detailed does it have to be? So if I'm going to explain that officers, I will just mostly just write what you wrote. Um. Well, let's see. I mean, it, it should be detailed enough to understand like what your timeline is other than so it, there's there's a couple situations here. It depends on the proposal, right? And the and the project that you're talking about, right? Okay. Because with some things it's going to be very clearly defined, right? Like it's going to be obvious what yeah, needs to be done and it's going to be like for the example the tutorials, right? If you, I think you yeah, said yeah. you were planning on including probably the tutorials in your proposal, <laughs> right? It's going to be very the most important thing with the proposals is the amount of time that you spend working on it uh, and that it's clear that you're going to spend like cuz Google's expecting that people are spending 30 plus hours a week on the on their project, right? Um so it needs to be clear that like the amount of work that you set out to do is something that you could that you would be spending that much time on, um, and then it also like like it's also just needs to be clear to the mentors like what you're planning on doing, right? Like obviously, I think everybody that's on the call right now, it's very it's very clear to me and everybody else what you plan on doing, right? Like there's no uh, there's no question about that. It's really just more of like okay, how do you plan to do that within that that like that time period, right? Like how, what are you going to be working on, you know, each week so that you are actually like making that time commitment. Um, and in this case, okay, so in your case, right, your your tutorials, I think you'll be able to, to fairly easy estimate like how long that yeah. will take you, right? Yeah. And with this, it's sort of like, okay, none of none of us really know how long this is going to take you, right? Yeah, like, that's what I wrong and, because of the timeline that we told yeah. was fairly easy. Yeah, like and that's, when it, when it comes to things like that, it's like, so, 
if you're acting like it's going to come down to like you need to set some goals for yourself like okay i'm going to have the uh first of all you're going to need to do things like and and it depends like if you just jump right into this or if you keep hitting issues but you're going to need to do things like okay go play with nats for a while right and you're going to need to just write some code that works in nats uh that, that works with nats using their apis right um and that's going to be something that you're going to need to budget time for. So, like, it might take you a week to figure out, okay, how do I write um, a few things that are published and subscribe to different channels and talking to each other appropriately, right? And then now, how do I write that within DFFML, right? And now, how do I figure out how to write the CLI command that... So, break it down into, into the various things that need to happen here, right? So, we know that we need... We know that we need two networks, two new networks, right? Uh, we know we need the operation implementation network um, that that is that is listening for things, and then we know that we need the the input network, right? So we know we need a network that's published and subscribed. Uh, sorry, obviously, <laughs> um, we need yeah, we need it. We need each network, so we need to write that. So you need to first you need to figure out how to do channels, and then you need to you need to figure out how to do the implementation network and so we've gone through here like okay i need to figure out how to instantiate everything i need to make sure that the instantiation process is working right and then you need to be able writing all all the tests for all these things right um and and a lot of what your workflow i think is going to look like is you're gonna want to leverage heavily and let me write this in here so uh going to want to heavily leverage the unit test dot mock uh, dot patch uh, functionality um, because you'll want to write uh, the uh, the NATS uh, operation network slash uh, and um, input network. So, input network and uh, test, like, and test the, like, you you'll want you'll want to set it up so that you can basically fake the NATS connection and not actually have them connected to NATS, right? So you'll want to write the the operation implementation network and the net input network and have them uh, doing like and have them not really connected to NATS um, and. And so you're going to need to figure out how you're going to set up all that testing stuff, yeah. right? So, so basically, when we say, okay, we're spinning up, like this example use case that we just talked about, where where we've got the the master node, and then we've got all the other nodes. So, for example, just that that base instantiation use case, right, where you've written the Nats class, and just to get it started, you say every time it says instantiate. Right, because we will go through and we instantiate everything. So every time it says instantiate, there's some call to the Nats API in there that's doing the publish command. So you mock out that publish and you say that, yes, it was successful, right? And you make sure that everything worked, right? The rest of your code worked, even though you weren't really connected to Nats, right? Um, so you're going to need to figure out, like, you're going to need to budget time for doing all of that. And I think you'll sort of find quickly here that you've already got, like, uh, just to, within the things we've talked about here, you've got like a few weeks of things yeah, to do, yeah. right? You've got like, you know, maybe a, a week or so for each, like it's probably like a week for each tutorial to make sure that it's really all clean. And then it's like a week to figure out NATS and then it's a week to write the basic, um, like what you think the implementation network should look like. And then it's probably mm -hmm. another week to, to thoroughly test that thing. And then yeah. input network, week to test, and then the rest of the weeks so you're figuring out how to integrate it correctly right um and then write the docs you'll need to write some docs for it um and i'm not sure how many weeks we have exactly it's like 11 or 12 or something 13, 13. okay yeah 13. so i think i think you can safely say like you can safely say that that um 
like you you can you can budget some weeks and then you know with a project like this where yeah, it's I, very I end of line you can say the rent like like right kind of yeah things. yeah and like the other thing is like when accepting proposals like like you know we know we know like we know you and i know i think we know most of you guys on the phone call and stuff and, and you guys are you guys have been here and you guys have been working right and so it's like you know the, the people who we know we can trust to actually like do stuff those are above i know there are some people there are always people that submit that we've never heard from before right and it's like well i don't like not we don't know that you're actually going to follow through on this because you haven't actually done done anything before right uh whereas like all you know the people who are existing members of the community it's like oh we know we know where we are we know we can count on you to, to actually do this right so if you say like i'm not sure how much time this will take like well we trust you that you will be working on it because i'm going to be watching your pull requests and if you're if you're not doing it like i'm i'm going to be expecting that the pull requests are coming through with the work in progress tag right whereas other people they you know they they haven't submitted anything and they don't know that they should be, you know, putting up their work with a work in progress tag so that we know that they're doing something, right? Like we're seeing you actively push work when you have a work in progress pull request up, right? Like we see the lines of code coming through. So we know you're working on it, even though you haven't gotten it merged, right? And so that's important, right? Um, but yeah, does that sort of... Yeah, 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 cool. Yeah, all right. Uh, anything else from anybody? Well, if that is it, um, have a good night, and I will talk to you guys next week, and I'll, I'll try to clean these things up, and let me just recap for myself. There's Conda, and there is, uh, yes, the, the, the mentor portal stuff, and then uh, we need some issues to track this. Um, so, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys, and have a great night, and stay healthy out there. Or, well, stay healthy inside, because don't go out anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See you guys. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.